This week on C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast, journalist Annie Jacobson chronicles the sequence of events that would occur at home and around the globe following the launch of a nuclear missile. Author and national security analyst Joe Cirincioni interviews her. Since March 19, 1979, C-SPAN, a public service funded by the cable television industry, began giving you direct access to government in an innovative way by putting you, the viewer, into the rooms where politics is debated and policies are determined. C-SPAN began as a bold initiative. Now, 45 years later, we are essential for those wanting to see democracy at work without editing or commentary. With continued cable support, we've done this without a dime of government funding, maintaining our independence. As we mark 45 years, the business of media is rapidly changing, and now your support is crucial for our mission's future. Support our legacy of unfiltered access by donating today at cspan.org slash donate. Thank you. Annie Jacobson. Thank you very much for sitting down and talking about your book. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm delighted to have this opportunity. How are you feeling? I'm delighted to be with you, so all the compliments back at you. It really is a pleasure. Thank you. Well, let's get right into this. Um, This is a brilliant book. This probably isn't the right thing to say about a book called Nuclear War, but I really enjoyed reading it. it. It reads like a thriller. You've taken policy and history and details and nuclear weapons effects and war games and and wove them together into a page turner. I read this in about two days just while taking extensive notes. So let's get right into one of your central points of the book, which is the concept of nuclear deterrence. Dr. Strangelove tells us in the movie named after him that deterrence is the art of instilling in the mind of the enemy the fear to attack. But in your hands, deterrence almost becomes a character in your book. It changes, it morphs, it, 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 it almost has, has motivation, but it becomes one of the central drivers of your, of your storyline. So please, tell us how you think about the concept of nuclear deterrence and how it works in theory and in practice. Mm-hmm. I mean, thank you for that intro. And in many ways, the concept of deterrence is very Kubrickian or... Orwellian, really, right? And that is a central theme. And But I also want to say thank you so much for letting me know that the book reads fast, yeah. because that is the intent. And we're going to obviously get into the policy and the foundations of it. But I believe as an investigative journalist, my job is to inform the people. And the best way to do that is to get their attention. We're all fighting for people's attention yes. these days. What could be a more important topic that is absolutely not discussed, although we'll caveat that with the present day, which neither of us expected probably one or two years ago. But people really don't talk about nuclear war, and they must, because things must change. And so we begin with deterrence, right? So for laymen, which, you know, I am in in spirit, even though this is my seventh book, uh, which deals with military and intelligence issues, Deterrence at its heart is this idea that if you have a bunch of nuclear weapons and the other side has a bunch of nuclear weapons and you both keep them pointed at one another, the world will be safer. And that is really simple, really terrifying, and also really bizarre, you Mm -hmm. know, because the next statement that comes out of anyone's mouth who really believes in deterrence And we have to believe in in it, or otherwise the alternative is collapse. Um, Or in the the words of a deputy STRATCOM commander, the unraveling. Yes. Right? Right? So, but that's what deterrence is. It's like, okay, we're just going to have more nuclear weapons, or rather, said differently, I would say, deterrence is like, the more nuclear weapons you have, the safer you are. Right. So you talk about it in the mm-hmm. book as, first, it's rule number one of nuclear war, mm. although later on you have a little plot twist. There are no rules <laughs> in nuclear war. You also talk, it as a con- about, you talk about it as a concept that is sold to Americans uh, to make nuclear weapons their savior, not their, mm-hmm. their, their threat. And in the book, you, you, the whole um, plot is about what happens when deterrence fails. And I think this is how yeah. I feel about deterrence. It's a great idea until it doesn't work. 
And when it doesn't work, it fails catastrophically. Absolutely. And that idea came to me from having, before nuclear war, a scenario. I previously wrote six books on mm. these, the Pentagon, the CIA, DARPA. Um, and, you know, a hundred plus sources in each book, almost all of them at some point during a lengthy interview saying, I dedicated my life to preventing mm. nuclear World War III. And most people said that to me with a kind of, you know, swelling yes. pride, legitimately so. And so during the previous administration, when President Trump was talking about fire and fury, all that nuclear war rhetoric, I got to thinking about what all those sources had told me, and I thought, mm. what happens if deterrence fails, if prevention fails? What would that be like? And what I learned didn't just shock me, it shocked me again and again and again right. and again, and that's what I put in the book. I put what I learned right. from top tier, upper echelon, national security people who opened the door into this world so that I could really see what happens. And as you know from reading the book, it happens in seconds and minutes, not days and weeks. Right. I think it's um, 78 minutes. Se Your nuclear <laughs> war takes right 78 around there, minutes. Yes. Yeah. Three acts, 24 <laughs> minutes each. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that's that's not my nuclear war, by the way. That's based on a quote from former STRATCOM commander, General Keeler, yeah. when he and I were discussing uh, war, you know, nuclear war between Russia and America, and he said the world could end in the next couple of hours. Yes, right, about an hour and a half, something like that, when you just start doing the calculations, yes. as you do. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to right. launch a weapon? What happens when the other side sees the weapon? What do they do? What's their decision process? That's why this is a, a thriller. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's history, it's policy, but it's really acting out how does this play out what would you decide to do in Moscow, in Washington, or in Pyongyang? Because right. the, 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 this all starts with yes. North Korea. And, and let, me, let me get us mm -hmm. to that, because mm -hmm. you start your book with a bang. I mean, literally. literally. You blow up mm -hmm. the Pentagon with mm -hmm. a one megaton thermonuclear explosion. But then, like all good movies, with a dramatic mm -hmm. sequence in the beginning, you then back us up. Mm -hmm. You then say, well, how did we get here? So why did you choose that approach? Tell us a little mm -hmm. about what you, what you learned and what you write about, about the beginning of the nuclear age, because in some ways right. you're picking up where Oppenheimer ends, right? What happens after the movie, after we decide to build the hydrogen bomb? Tell that, us. That's right, and that is so important, and you, a historian, know that as well, that where we come from you know, Shakespeare, past is prologue, right? Mm. So how did we wind up with this many nuclear weapons? And I take the reader through that, I think relatively quickly, or rather in a very sort of pared down manner so that people can see where, you know, when I begin this, the launching scenario, because the book does take the reader from nuclear launch to nuclear winter. And, you know, one of the things that was really shocking to me was learning all that history in depth and figuring mm. out how do I make this zoom, right? How do you just rip through this? Um, I think you said you read it in a night or two, right? Yeah. And so the one section that comes to mind to answer that question is when I was looking at the buildup of nuclear yes. weapons. Right. And I literally, it's like three or four pages in the book where I'm just showing you this year, this number of weapons, this year. I thought that was brilliant, by the way, because I've written about this myself, and I've done these charts, and I've mm -hmm. talked about the nuclear mountains, and, but I've never broken it down that way. And it was stunning to see how quickly we went from two, three nuclear yes. weapons at the end of World War II to by the time the buildup sort of peaks in when what when John F. Kennedy's inaugurated, we have 20,000 nuclear weapons built in just 15 years. I mean, it's, that, that alone kind of tells you everything you need to know. And I felt like that was such an important thrust of the narrative because the average person walking down the street, if they hear launch on warning policy, which we'll get into, you know, deterrence, uh, you know, sole presidential authority, they just, their eyes glaze over and they go, oh, that's for the 
PhD crowd. And I think it's the opposite. As you know, there is a tiny ray of hope in this with the idea of Reagan reversal. We'll talk about that yes. later. But, you know, most people simply don't want to have to wrap their brain around these policy issues. And almost inevitably, the policy issues turn political. Absolutely. And that is fundamentally at our own peril. And when I say our, it's not just you and me, it's not just every American, it's the whole world. Right, you know? right. So t talk about the buildup. What, mm -hmm. what motivated the buildup? Because mm -hmm. I, I write in yeah. one of my books about how the Air Force, you know, around the 1940s thought, you know, we're not going to need more than 60 nuclear weapons. After that, right. they said we run out of targets. But right. that is not the view that prevailed. Right. You talk about early on, the, 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 some groups in the Pentagon sketching out how many weapons they would need to completely destroy the Soviet Union. That's right. And that's where you're just sort of reading with your jaw dropped. And it does right. feel more like Dr. Strangelove than reality. And then you must remember that in the early, in the 50s and parts of the <clears throat> 60s, the idea among the admirals and the generals at the Pentagon was that nuclear war would be fought to win, which is now the most absurd concept that you could ever not wrap no, your head around. No, but that's right, that we yeah. were going to fight and yes. win a nuclear war, right? Yes, absolutely. And, and interviewing many sources, as I do, former secretaries of defense, people that advise the president who are now in their 80s and 90s, they were young men when this con yes. these concepts were being you know, promoted. You mean like former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry? Yes, absolutely. And and there was this idea of more, you know, the more nuclear weapons, the better. Right. You just have more. More is more. And that takeaway, I think, is just, you cannot really get around that other than thinking, this is madness. And you bring us into one of the early meetings, I think it's 1960, mm -hmm. where the, the military has decided, and this is even before McNamara becomes yeah. Secretary of Defense, that they need to have a single integrated operation plan, PSYOP, mm -hmm. for nuclear war. And, they're, and you bring us into a meeting, and I didn't know this, I'd never seen this. One of the participants took notes, which, um, which then reveal what he was thinking yes. as this plan is laid out. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. And, and how you got your hands on his yeah, notes. You're speaking about John Rubel. Yes. And, you know, the nuclear war plans are among the most jealously guarded secrets Absolutely. in the national security apparatus bar none, right? Yeah. They just don't want anyone to know. And then running parallel to that very secret idea is the fact that no one would break ranks, right? So you've got issues of security clearances and you've also got issues of culture, right? It would just be you know, abominable to, to break ranks. Well, John Rubel did in a tiny memoir. I mean, it's so thin, and it was published in 2007 or 2008. And because America was in the middle of the war on terror, this got almost no notice. And that is what that is from. So those are not like some right, secret... He was like a deputy director he, of... Um of uh, Pentagon planning? Of research and engineering. Research and right? engineering. Which you and I both know is like a pathway yeah, to yeah, maybe yeah. be sacked up. Yeah, there's right? only a handful of people yes. in this room, a couple of dozen, and he yes. was one of them at the highest level. Yes, and he, so there he is in 2000, in the, in the early 2000s, a man in his 80s, knowing he is going to die sooner than later, and he decides to write a memoir talking about yeah how he felt and that was what was key because he speaks of the war plan through the long lens of history yes as a mass extinction plan right and that really kind of takes your breath away and he compares it from right about this to another meeting i mm -hmm. didn't know about till i read your book yeah. in, in nazi germany mm -hmm. in 1942 when the leaders of nazi germany are sitting around discussing very calmly yeah. a plan to exterminate millions of Jews systematically on an industrial scale and he thinks of that plan when he's sitting around. That's absolutely right, the Vonsai Conference. And to equate those yes. two notions in your mind as a man in your 80s who had dedicated, you know, Rubel dedicated his life to 
this kind of militaristic, you know, effect, if you yeah. will. And to have that turning point in your own mind, I think, is really remarkable. Well, you know, the, you know, I've worked in the House Armed Services Committee, mm -hmm. and I'm working on nuclear issues. I've written about them. I've been in think tanks. In 1991, when I was still on staff and I had top secret mm. code word clearance, I went to the Strategic Air Command, it was still mm. called SAC, okay. to get a briefing on the PSYOP. General wow. Lee Butler was the commander at the time. As you know, he later <laughs> leaves and becomes an ad advocate for nuclear abolition. But at the time, he gave us sort of a sanitized mm -hmm. view. And in this picture, he's talking about the target list. And in this n unclassified version of it, we dropped 60 nuclear bombs on the city of Odessa, which mm -hmm. was then in Ukraine, which was then still part of the Soviet Union. Soviet Union hadn't collapsed yet. And I'm looking at this, and I, when I read your book, I'm thinking, that's what I thought. What, what's his name? Rubel? Rubel. Rubel. What yeah. Rubel is thinking, I'm thinking, this is genocide. Right. 60 nuclear weapons on one city, and that's just one of the targets of the plan. Mm -hmm. And I know the military would vigorously disagree with this, but this is what you're pointing out in your book is this is the natural consequence of deterrence. For deterrence to work, you have to have a nuclear machine ready to execute. Right. And what it means, and that's what happens in your book, is okay, what happens when deterrence fails for whatever reason and we start to execute this? Absolutely. And then you realize there is no turning back. It's a system. You it's know, the decision system. trees are in place. No one, no one changes their mind. You're, there's no room to change the mind. The mind is set from the minute that the United States detects nuclear launch. Right. And that becomes really frightening and also compelling at the same time. Again, looping back to, I think, what you and I are both in agreement about, that nuclear, this, a book like this is not meant to scare people and sort of, you know, make them even more militaristic. It's simply to make them educated and willing to realize, wait a minute, the world that we live in today is very different than it was in the 1950s, yes. and from technology to nuclear armed nations. And so shouldn't we all be having the conversation rather than leaving it to a small group of people who are like the version today of the John Rubels of the 1950s yes. who might later have an epiphany, or maybe none of us will be here to have that epiphany because this is a situation where we are all now walking on the razor's edge. Right. There are no villains yeah. in your book, with the mm. possible exception of Kim Jong-un, um, who, whose reasons for launching the attack mm. are not known, right. which they, in real life, that's true. You wouldn't mm. know why someone has done this. Mm -hmm. You would just see the missile launching. Right. But there are villainous concepts, and you mm. get into these, mm. and they become sort of characters in the book and they date back to the 50s and 60s. So let's talk about this and what you think about launch on mm. warning, sole authority, first use of nuclear weapons, right. launch on warning. Right. Tell us about that. Launch on warning, again, you ask the average person on the street, they have no idea what that is, including me, before right. I really drill down on this. Launch on warning is exactly like it sounds. La we launch on warning. So, okay, so what does that mean? Then you have to pull back for a second to the most basic concept of strategic missiles, which again, most people don't realize. It's like, you can learn it in one page in my book. An ICBM is a ballistic missile that travels from one continent to another in approximately 30 minutes. It's 33 minutes from Pyongyang, it's 26 minutes and 40 seconds from Moscow, okay? So these are down to the seconds and minutes. So when you consider that amount of time, then, an analogy would be this is not 9-11 happening. This is not the Pentagon suddenly realizing that planes have hit the towers. This is a system of systems, nuclear command and control, that Americans have spent trillions of dollars setting up, with most of us not having any idea, since the 1950s, 60s. So now we have satellites. There is a satellite system in space. Yeah. You, of course, know this. We're yeah. bringing the reader or the listeners up to yeah. speed. The satellite system in space is so technologically advanced, it sees the ballistic missile launch. It sees right. the, the exhaust coming out the bottom of the rocket right. from space, 
in under a second. Yes, it's actually a remarkable technological achievement. I mean, it really is. Yeah, and when you but, know but that, that these are our early warning satellites. The, and once you learn, I think once you learn that as a reader, you go, okay, now I get it, right? Launch on warning. Right. So we see, we, we have a warning from our satellites, early warning satellites, mm -hmm. that a missile has launched. Then what happens? And then everything begins. Because, and by the way, we have satellites parked over all the nuclear armed nations, so we are watching for the launch. Right. And in then geosynchronous orbit. Absolutely. And then this, the situation begins. And so, as I show in the book, because I take readers in seconds, you know, and then we speed up to minutes. But immediately that data gets sent down to these nuclear command and control facilities. There's one called the Aerospace Data Facility in Colorado, and they begin to interpret the information because now it's all about the missile's trajectory, right? Again, super fast. I mean, who knew that after 150, 180 seconds, the Defense Department knows, the Space Force, the, the an analysts, the machine learning, the Defense Department knows whether or not that missile is heading toward Honolulu or the East Coast. And so then you begin to realize this driving intensity is only building as all of these different individuals are getting ready to brief the president. Yes, right, and they have minutes to do so. And the president has, depending on the scenario, mm -hmm. somewhere between six and maybe 10 minutes to go through the whole thing from the time he's sipping his coffee at the White House dining room to the time that he's in the Situation Room and getting the briefing mm -hmm. or in the secure bunker, mm -hmm. as you point out. No doubt, not thinking about nuclear right. war and worrying about a bunch of other things. So why? Mm -hmm. what, 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 why the rush to mm -hmm. launch our nuclear weapons? Mm -hmm. Well, that gets into policy, and I do think that's where a lot of people get really lost in the weeds, because now you're talking about second strike and first, you know, all these different capabilities, but ultimately it's that well, the greatest saying is use them or lose them, stat. I mean, I say great in yeah. jest, but that is a common phrase that the idea is if the weapons are coming at us in that approximately 30 minute time period, the Defense Department must be able to launch our nuclear weapons, particularly our 400 ICBMs in silos across the country. Otherwise, they will more than likely be targeted by the enemy. Yes. And so, you know, what I was, I was fascinated to learn about these three different command bunkers, right? Because it makes it very simple. There's the Cheyenne, these are the nuclear, these are the powers that be in these three different bunkers are suddenly all taking this information and getting ready yes. to, com to communicate with the president. And it's Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado, which is like maybe known by people because of movies, <clears throat> right? It plays a role in a couple. I've been there. Right. It's as You've impressive as it looks. Yes, on TV. I yes, it really is a big giant steel yeah. door, and it is deeply underground, and it's designed to yeah. withstand an impact from a very large nuclear weapon. Yeah, that's interesting that you've been there. Yeah. Um, there's, the, there's that, and then there's the bunker beneath the Pentagon. Yes. And then there is the bunker beneath STRATCOM, which again, it's one of the most significant military organizations that almost no one's heard of. Yes. Right? Strategic Command. You've been to the former, um, and that is in Nebraska. And there's a bunker beneath there. The way it was described to me, Cheyenne Mountain is the brain stem. Mm. The Pentagon is the beating heart of nuclear war. STRATCOM is the muscle. And that pretty much gives you a great sort of poetic sense of those parts are now going to work with the president to get the counterattack going. So launch on warning is one of the mm -hmm. villainous concepts. And again, there's no villains here. There was a mm. debate at some point in your book between one of the well, the Secretary of Defense, who is in, in favor of waiting, and the head of the Strategic Command, mm -hmm. who's in favor of going. But neither one is evil, right? That's right. There's no Jack right. Ripper. There's no yeah. General Jack Ripper wow. here who's mad. These are people logically following the system and the policies we set yes. out. And that's what's so chilling about your book, is that there's no crazy person here, with the possible exception mm -hmm. of Kim Jong Un. It's just this is the way, this is the process we set up, and we, we, we then get to the next concept that you discuss in detail, which is sole authority. Right. And there's two sides to that. Why don't you tell us what sole yeah. authority is? Sole authority, again, just like it sounds, that the president of the United States has sole authority when it comes to launching nuclear weapons. He does not ask anyone, not the Secretary of Defense not the chairman 
of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and not the Congress. Interestingly, if you Google, like, could the president launch a nuclear war, you will see that more people believe that is a fallacy than know it's actually a fact. Yeah. That is stunning to me. During the, again, the fire and fury rhetoric with President Trump, there was so much attention to that issue, which had been sort of long buried, right, that Congress released a congressional report stating that sole authority was in fact actual and that it is an inherent to the commander in chief. And they really l laid out that he doesn't need to ask anyone. Right. So the safety half of that mm -hmm. is that a lower ranking uh, officer, even a jet colonel, a general, mm -hmm. can't order the release of nuclear weapons. Only the president can do that. And Harry Truman started that. John mm -hmm. F. Kennedy institutionalized it. But the other part is it is that once the president wants to launch a nuclear we weapon for whatever reason, no one can overrule him. That's right. And that's another paradox that is very, I would say that's a sinister paradox, right? Because yeah. it's, it, it puts this authority in one person literally that can bring upon the end of civilization. And then you have to say to yourself, how, how is that just acceptable? And again, that kind of loops back to my idea that I think most people are busy with other things yes. rather than thinking about yes, this. Yes, and yes. it's important that we do because the world is a, sep is a different animal and some of these issues could be really benefit from being discussed more transparently among all kinds of people. Right. The, the launch of all our weapons all the way up requires two people to agree, even the, in the Minuteman silos. Yes. Two keys mm -hmm. have to be turned mm -hmm. to guard against right. an unstable right. individual, except right. for the most important decision maker, the president. And there it's him and only him. Yeah, Absolutely. It's interesting. So why did you decide to do this book as a scenario? Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to play it out like this? rather than mm -hmm. talking about the history, the concepts, yeah. <laughs> the way I right. do in right. my books. Right. Again, that has to do with wanting the most people possible to have an opinion or a discussion about this issue. Yeah. And I know from, you know, experience that people are very interested in things that they can digest yes. reasonably and quickly. And that makes perfect sense. You know, that doesn't mean that there aren't markets and you know, libraries for really intense books, many of which I source in the back of my book. An extensive bibliography, excellent so sources the, cited here. There, we're all on the same team. They're all part of the same concept of, you know, making people aware of their America. And I think that once I realized, as I began reporting this, that the scenario format was the only way to go because I could find nothing more dramatic and nothing more important and nothing more dangerous than the speed with which all of this gets set in motion yes. once launch on warning happens. Yeah. And you, you also discuss um, another aspect of, of deterrence. You know, for in, the, in the history of the nuclear age, there's been a longstanding debate between whether we needed to get rid of these weapons or whether we needed to build more of these weapons. And the people who want to build more have always argued sort of uh, against relying on arms control, on mm -hmm. reduction or trying to eliminate the weapons. And instead, we have to rely on our military might. And in some ways, recognizing the flaws in deterrence, that if it mm -hmm. fails, it fails mm -hmm. catastrophically, they've come up with the idea of missile defense. That if the worst should happen, if somebody should launch a missile or missiles at us, we can devise ways of shooting them down the way we have anti-aircraft weapons to shoot down bombers. You talk about missile defense mm. in this book as a myth. And you go through how this would actually work based on what we now have and what we could foreseeably have uh, uh, for, the, for the next uh, 10, 20 years mm. or so. Tell me about how yeah. you came to those views about missile defense and how you see this operating. There's so much misinformation 
in when it comes to missile defense, right? So I was at a dinner party when I was in the early stages of working on the book and mentioned this to the person sitting to my right, at which point they said something to the effect of, oh, Annie, oh, yes. we have a missile defense system. We have interceptor missiles that would shoot all this down. And they likened the situation to the Iron Dome. And yes. I didn't want to correct them. Because missile defense is missile defense, yes. right? And I didn't want to correct them. I figured I'm going to send them a copy of my book when it publishes. Uh -huh. But And I went to the experts. I went to everyone who knows. And you know this, but most people don't, that we have a grand total of 44 interceptor missiles. Those missiles have a success rate of between 40 and 55%. And those About are half the time. Half the time. Under ideal conditions. Yes, or you could call, they're called curated tests, right? Mm -hmm. So like, Charlie, we're going to be sending a missile your way. How's that? You know, I mean, yeah. this is what they do. So how easy, it's, it's not sort of a madness and mayhem unfolding, caught off guard situation. Yeah. 44, half, approximately half of them are going to be successful. Now consider this number. Russia has 1,670 nuclear weapons ready for launch. You and I both know those numbers change a little every year, but most people don't know that n number. Never mind the thousands on reserve, right? right? America, because it's all about parity, has 1,770 nuclear yes. weapons with several thousand on reserve, okay? So how are 44 missiles going to defend against more than a thousand? But even if they worked perfectly. Even if they worked all the time. And so then you, and of nuclear war, is, the premise of it is to send the mother load. And so that is a fantasy. You know, I had a lieutenant general who is not a source for me, but I wanted to keep some people who were not sources in the books, so they had no horse in the race, but rather they would read for me at the very last stages of the drafts you know, for fact-checking, for accuracy, for you might want to look deeper at this or that. And I was almost hoping that someone said to me, you know, Annie, you shouldn't report that because we do secretly have an iron dome, right? Something that right. tipped the hat to that maybe I was wrong. Right, so and I no know people that. think that there's some secret weapon. They do. Right. They really do. And then people, some, you know, they say, oh, lasers, you know, and you and I both know, and this we're not going to get into the policy of it, and too technical, but again, more fantasy. The bottom right. line is you cannot defend against a right. nuclear war, it o right. which is why right. it only ends one way. Right. It ends in total annihilation. Right. We would all like to have an effective missile defense system, not against it sort of in theory, it's just that it doesn't exist, it doesn't and we've exist. been trying since yes. we just passed the anniversary, the 41st anniversary of Ronald Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative mm -hmm. speech in March of 1983, and we've spent about $350 billion with America's best scientists and, and mm -hmm. contractors working on this, and we do not have an effective missile mm -hmm. defense. We can shoot down short-range rockets like yes. the Israelis yes. do with Iron Dome. Mm -hmm. That's a major technological mm -hmm. achievement. We can shoot down scuds that travel yeah. about 300 miles, but an ICBM right. deploying decoys and as you do, right. chaff right. or radar jammers, Yep. It's impossible. We just can't do it. So there is no safety. There is no shield. Mm -hmm. There is a, no safety net. Here's a little anecdote I'm going to share because sometimes it's easiest to wrap the head around these very highfalutin concepts with just an image, right? Right. The ballistic missiles, when they're in mid-course phase, when they're essentially trying to be shot down by the interceptors. Right, outside the atmosphere, yes. they're in space. So they're 500 miles up, right? Yes. They're 500 miles yes. up. Yes. And the way the interceptor works, you've got the ballistic missile going, and the interceptor, ours, are in Santa Barbara. We have four in Santa Barbara and 40 in Alaska. Yeah. And the interceptor missile is going to try and meet the incoming warhead 500 miles above the ground. Traveling, one is traveling 20,000 miles an hour, the other is traveling 14,000 miles an hour. Even a spokesman at the Missile Defense Agency said it was akin to shooting a bullet with a bullet. Right. Good luck. Right. And under ideal conditions, mm -hmm. remarkably, sometimes we can actually right. do that, but we need a cooperative target. We need a target mm -hmm. that's not trying to evade us mm -hmm. or spoof us mm -hmm. or jam us or attacking right. the radars, et cetera.
God, this is great. Okay, so you, it, one of the things I like about the way you do this um, is that you interrupt your, your story with little uh, historical uh, vignettes, a little lesson. It reminds me of uh, John Dos Passos, and how he does USA, which he tells the story, but he interrupts it with what he called newsreels at the time. So you do that mm -hmm. here, just to give us a, another perspective. The first one you do is on deterrence, and you say it's the number one rule of nuclear mm -hmm. war is deterrence. But then you later go on to say the, the number one rule right. of nuclear war is that there are no rules. So tell us a, a little bit about what, about what you yeah. mean about that. Well, the, you know, you have all these very specific protocols, these systems of systems. It's a sequence of events that are all mapped out and everyone is rehearsing. But then you have parallel lines of intention, right? And I'll give you an example. And I'm talking about with, you know, in the event that an um, incoming nuclear missile is coming at the United States, it's yeah. detected, right? So we've spoken about the Defense Department, STRATCOM, command and control, what's happening over in this one lane. But then the other lane of what's happening with the president was uniquely interesting to me. Having written about the Secret Service in a previous book, and specifically the Secret Service's paramilitary team, which protects the president, the counter-assault team, the CAT team, I got to thinking and knowing what, how their job is to protect the life of the president no matter what, and they will go to any lengths. Then I was thinking, well, what would they do? Because, of course, if an incoming missile is coming into Washington, D.C., and the president's in Washington, D.C., the Secret Service is going to get him out. That yes. is going to be their focus. And they are very determined, and they also have a lot more weapons than anyone else around. Okay. Mm. And so in interviews with the, the former director of the Secret Service, with CAT team members, I learned about this other unique element called, uh, a unique part of the CAT team called the element. And that's who would come into play in the White House to move the president. Mm. And that was like interesting new reporting. I, it had not been on the record before. Very valuable for people to know because... I didn't know anything about that. Again, you're talking about these, you know, there are no rules. Like, so the CAT team is going to get him out. The STRATCOM commander is going to say, we need the launch order first. In the scenario I describe, the CAT team wins, and they take the president out. But there's a problem. Without giving too much away, another thing I was shocked to learn, of course, all about EMP, that's a whole, you know, electromagnetic pulse could very seriously threaten Marine One and cause it to crash. Yes. So the Secret Service director would order the CAT team and the element to make sure they had parachutes because they would need to jump the president out of Marine mm. One in the event that the helicopter was crashing. There are not enough parachutes for everyone. I mean, you get into these details where you realize this is where things start to unravel. You know, you, you, you take an approach similar to Eric Schlosser in his book, mm -hmm. Command and Control, mm -hmm. very detailed. Like when Eric describes a missile silo, you mm. almost know the colors mm. of the wires mm. that are holding up the light bulb in the hallway outside. So mm. wh why that approach? Why, why go so deep? Yeah, I think people relate to that. And I'm, again, I'm talking about laymen, right? Like just regular people. I mean, yeah. I'm, with all of my books, I'm often told I'm read, yes, by the generals and the admirals at the Pentagon, but I'm also read by the little old ladies in South Dakota, right? And that warms my heart because I am trying to take very complex, seemingly complex yes. issues and make them accessible to all of us. And I think specificity helps. Same with poetics help or anecdotes. When you really hear a detail that, you know, describes the color of paint on the wall or that there's not enough parachutes and the guy's running back and forth between the White House office to try to find another one, you start to be able to use your own imagination, to use your own thought process, and you become involved. Yes, yes, yes. Well, you do, mm -hmm. you paint a new world here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really draw us in. I am, I am in the Situation mm -hmm. Room. I am in the, the command bunker. I'm in Marine One when you're just, you, you just, didn't tell me what color the, the headphones were, but mm -hmm. just about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a, a, an excellent job. Doing and on that, I'm going to butt in for a second. Because that, like, one of my favorite parts about being an, a journalist is 
asking questions. You know, yeah, I'm yeah, usually yeah. in your seat, and <laughs> that is the joy. And I'm, huh. you know, I'm always working with people with top secret clearances and Q clearances. Like, tell me this. Tell, you know, it's like, well, I can't. You know, and and it's interesting because you, they can't tell you the classified details, but they can tell you the color of the headphones, and yeah, that yeah, yeah, becomes yeah, yeah. really right interesting. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's a book like this out there. You know, I've written a, f a few myself, mm -hmm. and it's really about history and policy and descriptions or, you know, nuclear bean counting, who's got what, mm -hmm. where. But this, the, the only, the closest parallel I can think to this is a movie, mm -hmm. The Day After. That came mm -hmm. out in the 1980s when the world was afraid that Leonid Brezhnev and Ronald Reagan were going to blow up the world. And it was the last time we were in an actual nuclear buildup an actual arms race mm -hmm. like we are once again. Did you think yeah. about the day after when, when mm -hmm. you decided, when you were conceiving this, this approach? Most certainly. When ah. I, I saw the day after when I was a high school student. <laughs> and I remember being terrified, you know. Uh, and I've since learned a couple interesting things which are actually quite hopeful, right? So yeah. one of them is that uh, ABC was initially told, you know, that they, or if there was a real discussion that they shouldn't, it was too terrifying, yes. right? Um, and so yet, they went ahead, they aired it, a hundred million Americans watched it, including right. me, including a very important American, President Ronald Reagan. Yes. Right? And that fame, his response to that miniseries becomes famously what is known as the Reagan reversal, or rather, with the inside baseball crowd in Washington, D.C., the Reagan reversal because he wrote Reagan wrote in his presidential di diary that he felt greatly depressed after watching it those are his words and as you know before then with the SDI and all Reagan's position was American supremacy no matter what he was very pro nuclear weapons he was pro build up he was for more power more nuclear power absolutely and he changed his position after seeing that he reached out to Gorbachev. And because of that, the two leaders communicated. And if there's a takeaway on the book, it's about communication, right? Com learn to communicate. Learn to communicate. That's the best. Not, don't learn to fight. Learn to communicate. Reagan and Gorbachev communicated. And as a result, the Reykjavik summit, the world went from its high point insanity. Yes, 70,000 nuclear weapons in the world. The you, almost equally divided between the U.S. and the Soviets. Yeah. I mean, 70,000, that is just astonishing. Yes. And now, 12,500 approximately today. Yes. Right? Many people would say that's, or some people would say that's 12,500 too many, but my God, that is a big shift. And yes. that's where we need to go now. Yeah. Uh, one of the p benefits of your book is to talk about what happens if you use those 12,000 weapons? What happens to the planet, to yeah. human civilization? And so you, you really then realize that even that number is enough to destroy right. in 78 minutes everything that humankind has created over millennia, right? So you yeah. can do that. And you think back to 70,000, you have to, what were we thinking? Well, it's very interesting that you give me that anecdote about Reagan's response to the day after, because I think the day after was in 84? 83. 83. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then in 85, Gorbachev is elected. We mm -hmm. get new leadership. We yep. have an opening. Reagan sees it, and you seizes it, yes. and you get that statement from the both of them. Yes. A nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought, yep. a phrase we still cite today. Just last year, the, nuclear, the five yes. nuclear powers in this UN Security Council we issued a, that statement, agreeing yeah. with it. I mean, that's like, an, that's like a statement that should be carved in stone yes. coming from those two individuals. And yet, our nuclear force posture, tell me what you think mm -hmm. about this, it, although the, the, we claim it's for deterrence, it's configured for war fighting. Right. I mean, that is, there's another paradox, or you could say a conundrum, right? Because you can't undo that. All, the legacy goes back to that these systems, the nuclear triad, the ICBMs, the submarines, the bombers, they were created and configured to fight and win nuclear fight war. Fight and win a nuclear right? war. And still are. 
So that hasn't changed. It's just that the policy, in air quotes, has shifted. But there, the, the fundamental sort of paradox of deterrence is that we will never use these weapons unless we have to. Yes. And so then if you're the Defense Department, you're going to say, unless we have to, you're going to plan for what happens if you have to. And you argue that being yeah. ready to go to nuclear war on a, a, in a few minutes notice is essential it to is. the deterrence mission. Right? So that's I mean, the that's how it's been set up. That is how it's been set up. And how do you unravel that? And I don't have the answer, but many wise people have been dedicated to looking at these issues. Well, I'm going to ask you mm -hmm. for a couple of answers in a second, in part because the New York Times, in a, in a mm -hmm. glowing review of, of your book, does take issue with this and say, mm -hmm. once you present the problem as vividly as you do, you have an obligation to say, well, what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. What should we do? But we'll get to that in just a second. Um, I wanted to just go back uh, to the, the concept of writing the book and the day after. Because when I read this, I felt like this reads like a movie. Did you write it that way? Are you thinking about this? Do you think this book mm -hmm. could be adapted for a, a film presentation? I think cinematically. Ah. I, that is the way I think um, when I was a young student in college, I wrote about uh, a book by Nabokov that became a book by Stanley Kubrick. Uh -huh. So I think... A movie a, by Stanley Kubrick. A, a movie, sorry, a movie, a book by Nabokov became... Lolita? Lolita, yes. Yeah. And so I think, and I also wrote about Clockwork Orange, uh. right? So um, I think about different mediums of expression. I'm like a storyteller. That's how I came out of the shoot. I'm really interested in how the human mind processes information and what it does with it, right? And to me, storytelling is the quintessential, you know, winner of all things. That's what interests me most. And so I think the two things entwine in my own thinking, and therefore it comes out um, in my writing. So I take that as a compliment. Oh, it is you know? a compliment. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I spent many years working in Washington, and then I went to work, work for Jessica uh, Matthews at the Carnegie Endowment, mm -hmm. and I thought it was a gifted writer until I met her. And she, her full name is Jessica Tuckman Matthews. Her mother is Barbara Tuckman, mm -hmm. Pulitzer Prize winner. Mm -hmm. um, and she says her mother used to keep a saying over her typewriter, will the reader turn the page? Wow. Will the reader yes. turn the page? Yes. And you've written a book where I kept turning the page. Mm -hmm. I needed to know what was going to happen wow. next. So you've given us a gifted story. You've given us a, a, a way to understand the almost 80 years of the nuclear age now. now and, and the dynamics that, that are present in the way we've, we've set it up. Mm -hmm. um, oh, <laughs> before I get to my last question, I want to, you said something about talking to people about this. And you, one of the responses you got was, oh, Annie. How yeah. often? Oh, did you I was going to say which one because that's a, that is a common. Oh, Annie, you yes. don't understand. Yeah. Yes, I mean that's been. Listen, that sometimes you know you can use friction to your advantage, um, and, and I certainly do. I'm an old hockey player, uh -huh. um, and so you know just think about the, your skate on the ice. It's all about fric friction and pushing off, pushing against. Yeah. And so when someone says to me, "Oh, Annie," which is an often phrase, you yeah, know, yeah. as if I don't know. I just take that as a challenge. And as I said, because I love storytelling so much, I love being a reporter. I love the people that I get to interview, you know. And that's a tricky situation because journalists are supposed to be so objective with their sources. And of course, I start out that way. But many of the people that I work with over years and sometimes a, more than a decade they end up, the source becomes a friend mm. after they're no longer in the book. Yeah. Because you, you, I love interviewing people. It warms my heart to be able to be curious and be willing to hear new things. Right. Well, you know, you don't use this phrase in your book, but here in, in Washington, we often talk about the nuclear priesthood. Mm. And they jealously guard mm. their right to 
be the one setting the rules for this, setting the budgets for this. Um, and it is a priesthood. It's, it's almost mm -hmm. all white men. There's some, it's changing slowly, but not, not very much when you come down to the authority. Did you run up against the priesthood? I, I mean, I just sort of, you know, the yeah. hockey player in me just goes around. Oh, them, that's right? good. I mean, because you, you're always going to find interesting, interested people. That's my yeah. theory. You know, a lot of people say to me, they look at my sources and they say, my God, how yes. did you get Secretary of Defense yes. Panetta? And how did you get all these people to talk to you? Well, if they had any idea of all the people I reach out to, they would realize it's, you know, eventually someone yeah. does. I just keep at it and keep yeah. trying. And now what has happened, because of course this is my seventh book, often I'll reach, reach someone on the phone and say, oh, thank you so much for agreeing. And I'll try to, you know, explain. They said, I've read your books. And so that becomes where you, where you feel like, oh, I've been at this a while. Excellent. Yeah, you're, it's wonderful how you bring them yeah. in to your, your, your scenario. Okay, you've written a book that talks mm -hmm. about war, talks about weapons, talks about unintended consequences, but here in Washington we talk about policy. Mm -hmm. So if you had the opportunity to walk 10 blocks down to the White House and go get a few minutes with President Biden, what kind of policy advice would you give him? And don't tell mm -hmm. me you don't do policy. Mm -hmm. This is your shot. Okay. You get to right. talk to Biden, mm -hmm. you've got a, a, a Less seven minutes to see him. What would you want him to do this year? What would you want him to do if he got a second term? Well, I'd certainly ask him to read Nuclear War Scenario, <laughs> because then we would both agree that we knew what we were talking about the same issues, because I was shocked to learn from secretaries of defense and others that the president, any president, most presidents remain terrifically ignorant about the issues that they are instilled with having to take control of should a nuclear war happen. And so that is really surprising. So it's like a quick read up on this situation that we're talking about here. And then I would ask th the current president, any president, to reevaluate from a democratic POV the idea. Small d? <laughs> Small d democrat? A, a, a president in the democracy. Oh, yes, yeah, no, no, yes, that's what I mean. Yes, of course, yeah, yeah. yes. I never make it about politics, right? right, right. Ever. So, um, thank you for that correction. Very important. Um, that the launch on warning policy, entwined with sole authority, are both inherently dangerous, perilously wow. dangerous, and must be reexamined. And there are a number of ways to do that, as you know, um, executive orders, having you know the Congress take a look at things, but they need to be unpacked and unwound, but first they have to be discussed. Because if no one knows about these policies, the president is never going to think they're important enough to address. And then they would be, in my opinion, sidelined into politics. The reason I avoid policy is because I just write about POTUS, for example, President of the United States. Yes. I have always written about the POTUS, but I don't write about politics. And as a result, I have just as many readers on each side of the aisle. And to me, that's the ultimate compliment. Because no one should be for a nuclear war. And everyone should be for a strong democracy. Little, you know. And so, le to, to my eye as a, as a journalist, it's just leave the politics to the politicians. So you would have the same advice to a President Trump as you would to a President Biden? I would. I absolutely would. To any president, because it's a presidential it should be an issue. It was a, it's a situation created by the president, so therefore it should be yeah. it should be addressed by any and every president. You know, in some ways, President Biden is uniquely qualified to change the rules of the game on this because he's because of his chairmanship mm -hmm. of the Senate Foreign mm -hmm. Relations Committee and how long he's been yes. around. I mean, yes. you know, with accumulated experience comes wisdom. Absolutely. And he is probably m more conscious of nuclear war and arms control efforts than any president we've had, with the possible exception of George H.W. Bush. And he said that you know, when, when we were afraid that Putin was going to use a nuclear weapon in Ukraine, we came, recent reports indicate we came closer to that than we had yes. thought at the time. He says, 
I, I don't know of any scenario where you can use a tactical nuclear weapon and have it not end right. in Armageddon. That's right. And you That's talk right. about this in your book, Thomas Schelling, that all the war games we've played, every single war game that we've played, and this is, I agree with you, you say in the book, I think this is true, escalates. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because once you get into it, the logic of the game, right? That it only ends in one way, in nuclear Armageddon. And I agree with you that a president who has been around for a while and who has worn different hats is going to have a, a greater scope of understanding and ultimately is going to have, I think, more wisdom and make better choices when presented with, this is the issue we need you to deal with. And so to that end, I think that in general, nuclear war and nuclear war scenarios should be top on the president's list of, you know, briefings, because we know he gets an early briefing. And then it kind of, at least I learned from Secretary of Defense, former Panetta, that, you know, that kind of goes, the president becomes concerned with other things and is no longer concerned on nuclear issues. So make that an, a, a regular issue to be dealt with and then also have people really care about it. I once said, why doesn't Congress do more about this? When I was interviewing some of my sources, and a number of them said to me, Annie, Congress only pays attention to what the people are paying attention mm -hmm. to. Well, you have given us a book that should get people's attention and is a tremendous contribution, in my view, to informing the public about the stakes, about the options, and about the history of, of how we got here and points us in the direction of how we can get out. So Annie Jacobson, thank you very much for your book. Thank you for joining us and having a, a, what I think was an informative, and I, can I say this, a highly entertaining discussion about nuclear war. It was a great discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you are interested in podcasts about nonfiction books, listen to C-SPAN's Book Notes Plus podcast for interviews with authors and historians hosted by Brian Lamb.